Welcome to Easel Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. So my name is Professor Debbie Shawcross. I'm a professor of hepatology and chronic liver failure at King's College Hospital and also a member of the Easel Scientific Committee. Now, many of you may not be aware, but today is World No Tobacco Day. Uh, an acknowledgement of that, we have a very special episode today in the studio on why we should stop smoking if you love your liver. And I'm honoured to be joined by an expert faculty who I'm going to ask to each introduce themselves to you, uh, starting with Professor Alazawi. Debbie, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm Will Alazawi. I'm Professor of Hepatology at Queen Mary University in London and the Royal London Hospital. And Vanessa? Hi, my name is Vanessa Stadelbauer Kölner. I'm an associate professor in gastroenterology and hepatology at the Medical University of Graz in Austria. And finally, Ramon. <clears throat> thank you, Debbie and Will. Thank you, Isil, also for this great session in a special day. My name is Ramon Bataler. I work in the liver unit in the Barcelona Hospital Clinic, and I'm a, a more, mostly expert in alcoholic liver disease, or alcohol-induced liver disease. Thank you. So thank you very much. So maybe if I could start off the chat by really asking you all, why do, why do we need to talk to our patients about smoking? Why, why is it important? Maybe I could come to you first, Ramon. Thank you, Debbie. So, well, probably every doctor should talk about smoking to any patient, regardless of the underlying disease. But traditionally, liver doctors were kind of ignoring this topic and until new studies and recent studies show very clearly that smoking facilitates the progression of liver disease, the progression to cirrhosis. And if you have a cirrhosis, it increases mortality. It increases your chances to develop cancers in the liver. Plus my particular patients that have more alcohol use disorder, they're more prone to develop esophageal cancer, mouth cancer, etc. So we're becoming more active in a holistic uh, approach to our patients. So we're more advising our, and assisting our patients to stop smoking. And Vanessa, what about you? What, what, yeah. How do you approach this? Yeah. So um, actually, I fully agree uh, uh, with what Ramon said. And I think so there are two aspects. One is the aspect as hepatologists that we uh, now know that uh, smoking affects the liver in several ways. I think we will maybe talk about the mechanisms a little bit later um, and that it uh, causes progression of the liver disease, that uh, smoking induces liver cancer. And the second aspect is uh, uh, that uh, we are all physicians, so we treat our whole patients, not only the liver. Uh, and in that sense, it is very important that we pay attention uh, to smoking. And I think even a third aspect is that smoking also affects other people. Unless uh, things like drinking alcohol uh, or eating too much, which only affects yourself. When you smoke, you also harm other people. Thank you. And, and, and Will, I mean, what do we do here? We tell our patients to lose weight, do more exercise, stop drinking alcohol, stop smoking. So there's a lot of competing priorities. So how do we go about approaching this as a hepatologist? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I, obviously, I agree with, with my colleagues, but I, I think we're really late to the game here, aren't we? I mean, every other specialty, smoking cessation is absolutely embedded in everything that all our colleagues up and down the corridors do. And, you know, it would, our listeners don't really need us to enumerate all of the other reasons why it's really important that smoking cessation should be top of the list. But traditionally, we've ignored it because, and I, and I come back to the word ignore in a moment, we've ignored it because actually our priority has been to stop the injecting drug use that has that will lead to the spread of viral hepatitis we've been trying to find individuals with um, occult infections we've been focusing on people stopping at alcohol consumption because they're turning up younger and younger and younger with alcohol induced problems and yet here we are suddenly realizing that that smoking that we have sort of talked about but not really made a big deal of is really life-changing for our patients 
if you wait till you get to the end and you say to somebody, actually, you know, we were talking about this just the other day, weren't we, Ramon, about not being allowed to have a liver transplant in some sectors. If you smoke, you need to stop smoking. And there's some cogent biological reasons why that might be the case. So I think the re the fact that we're having this is a brilliant this brilliant discussion. I think the the key though is to recognize that our patients need this advice from us in the same way that they need all the other advice, even before we start to get onto how it is we do it. And you know, our colleagues may want to jump in, but that idea of competing um, bits of advice, again, I don't think we should be afraid of it. Um, there are many specialties where there is more than one lifestyle change that needs to be addressed. Um, and the more holistic we become, and, and I think through recognizing that metabolic disease really drives liver disease, we are de facto becoming more holistic clinicians, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals. I think this is going to become something that we really need to take on along with all the other stuff we do. Fantastic. And Vanessa, you were saying in Graz, you take quite a, a unique approach to addressing this, working yeah. with your psychologist and your psychiatrist. So how do you go about doing sort of dealing with the competing priorities? Yeah, actually, um, I'm in a quite lucky situation here uh, because we have a so-called psychiatry liver clinic, which is right uh, uh, included in our hepatology liver clinic, where a psychiatrist uh, works with us mainly, of course, working uh, towards uh, stopping to drink uh, uh, before liver transplantation and also uh, problems that occur after liver transplantation. Um, uh, but my colleague here has uh, the approach uh, of the so-called motivational interviewing technique, um, where uh, she assesses all these risks, uh, these lifestyle risks uh, a patient has, but smoking clearly is one of the risks. And then together with the patients, uh, she decides which uh, uh, of the lifestyle factors has to be changed first. So in our case, this is, of course, most of the time alcohol because we are working towards uh, a listing uh, towards liver transplantation. Uh, but this doesn't mean that the other risk factors get ignored. They are just like, yeah, uh, one number down on the list. And as soon as the patients achieve success in stopping alcohol, they also have a lot of motivation to go on with other lifestyle factors. And then it's not uh, such a problem for them that they get a whole list from us what they have to change. And I think it's very, very important that also we as hepatologists think about this. I think that we maybe sometimes are, uh, yeah, uh, not ignoring it, but it's uh, not on the top of our priority list. For example, I think of patients with hepatitis C who only come to our liver clinic for a few times. They come in, get their diagnosis, get their treatment, come back. Uh, uh, we see that they have sustained virological response and they get a discharge letter and we don't see them again. Um, uh, I think we all have to think about these processes and where we can figure in uh, talking about smoking cessation because this is then really the driver in uh, uh, patients after cure of hepatitis hepatitis C, who then will develop hepatocellular carcinoma. So this should be in every um, uh, 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 discharge uh, visit of the patients and also in every discharge letter, we should or uh, we ha must uh, mention a smoking cessation um, because it will not be uh, helpful if patients only hear it once, they have to hear it several times. They have to hear it from us, from the psychologist, from their, they may go to the family doctor with their letter uh, and discuss this. And then eventually, hopefully we will succeed, help them to help them to stop smoking. So, so Vanessa, actually, so what you're describing there is a, like a hierarchy, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're describing a Maslow's hierarchy or Vanessa's hierarchy of <laughs> liver diseases, but also liver disease risk factors. So at any one point, one uh, risk factor may take priority in terms of what we're advising. And, you know, in the NHS, we have this concept of MEC, make every contact count. And so health promotion is actually the responsibility of every health professional. So while it may not be our priority, and clearly you can't bombard a patient with absolutely everything all at once, but increasingly what we're trying to do is to give patients the uh, ability to make those choices. So 
actually talking them through those hierarchies may be what we should do. And I've just got an interesting uh, snippet for you. You mentioned you don't think we ignore it. So in the UK, we um, uh, the British uh, Basel and the British Society of Gastroenterology uh, published the quality standard for the care of people living with fatty liver disease. And we've just audited uh, our practice. And I won't um, steal the thunder of the paper that's currently under review. But I had a look, and actually the headline number is that just over half of encounters involve a documentation of whether or not and how much the patient smokes. Now, you might say, isn't that terrible? The British are awful at what they're doing. But I think that's probably replicated all around the place. And um, so that's what we're doing. Just over half of us are thinking about smoking in fatty liver disease clinics, in that population who we go around telling everybody that they're at risk of cardiovascular disease. I, like, I, I think I, let me go down to earth to, to a couple of examples, for example, because when we prioritize, we have to go, for example, this morning I saw a patient with surviving an alcoholic hepatitis, a young patient with a massive anxiety, massive anxiety. He's just struggling to stop drinking. Smoking is to cope with the anxiety and he cannot tolerate a lot of anti-anxiety drugs because of liver failure. In this particular patient, I didn't focus on smoking initially because what is killing him is he's a high risk of dying because of smoking, the drinking. So I'm focused more in the drinking and in his scenario with a massive anxiety, I think he needs to smoke right now. So I am doing more stepwise. Well, the other day, for example, I saw a patient that was being evaluated for liver transplant with an cirrhosis, but a little port of thrombosis, with a little heart disease, with an stent that, uh, but he was still smoking. And I say, if you're gonna stop smoking, you will not be approved because you have already heart disease. We have been kind of generous uh, and probably you will need both a kidney and a liver transplant. In this patient, cessation of smoking became mandatory as a first thing and this the last thing i want to say as happens with nutrition or with alcohol it's not enough to say please stop smoking good luck be brave okay i'm with you go home no we have to try to send them to a smoking cessation program initially with patches but sometimes be careful with the patches of 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 uh, nicotine etc test positive for transplant in in we can obviously the the issue of transplantation and is mocking is sensitive, is center uh, dependent, but probably it's also patient dependent. If you have a high cardiovascular risk, a NAFLD uh, or, or a, an alcohol cirrhosis, et cetera, probably we have to be tougher and tougher in the smoking because there are not enough levers for everybody. That's a good point. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good point. And just bringing those two together, you know, um, are we allowed to ask you questions, Debbie? Oh, you can, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, you know, this is what we're hearing about is what you do in the very early clinic, a general clinic, maybe discharging patients because things have gone well. We're hearing about people who are right at the end of the spectrum, surviving acute alcoholic hepatitis or transplantation. But in that middle ground where we have the stable cirrhotic, who we monitor carefully because we're looking for complications. In your clinic, what's your approach to smoking cessation? In that hierarchy, where does that slot in? Because obviously that's the population in whom actually stopping smoking might reduce the risk of portal venous thrombosis, reduce the risk of developing liver cancer, reduce the risk of developing complications that actually their underlying cirrhosis may preclude them from getting the best possible treatment for. So how do you approach it in that group? Oh, it's so difficult because you we, we have a so as you say uh, you may be a 15 minute appointment if you're lucky mm -hmm. uh, when you've got to maximize the opportunities there and uh, it, it, you know you have to sort of prioritize what what's going to be important but you know often we've got patients haven't we who compensated cirrhosis they may be stopped drinking or they've had their hepatitis c treated mm -hmm. and actually they're, we're primarily bringing them back because we're uh, screening for hcc for the hcc development uh, and actually, uh, we're, we're very good at focusing on that. We're very good at doing our, our, our ultrasounds and our AFPs and things. But actually, do we think about those other factors that may increase their risk of developing HCC? Uh, and I remember, Ramon, you were telling me that you, you, you think actually in your unit, 
the the number of patients with compensated cirrhosis who who develop HTC is actually quite high who are smokers. I, mm. I, I think so you were saying there's a high figure. I, yeah. One day I tweeted something that I noticed one day. When you drink alcohol, you have a decompensated cirrhosis and you stop drinking is the number one cause of recompensate or R, recompensated cirrhosis. And typically you never st- a way that then will develop an ACC. And I notice that every single patient with recompensated alcoholic cirrhosis that developed HCC were smokers. When I saw that, plus a couple of patients that they compensated the cirrhosis, but they developed esophageal cancer because of the smoking, suddenly I say, so Ramon, you're not paying enough attention to the smoking. And that's why I decided to be much more proactive when you see the consequences in your patients is when you are really more aware of that. Mm. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, that's a very arresting sort of um, personal story on your part. But when you look at the numbers, the numbers aren't trivial either in terms of, you know, the actual hazard ratios, whether it's HCC development or all cause mortality, you know, it can be as high as sort of fivefold. Um, in particularly in women, and that we ought to talk about that as well, actually, that the risks are not the same for men and women alike, and they may be more, that women may be more uh, affected in this regard. All right. There's some data supporting that women are more sensitive to the smoking problems, yeah. And I think what Ramon mentioned uh, is also very important that it's not only HCC, that's also other types of cancer, especially esophageal cancer uh, or head and neck cancer in our patients who smoke and drink alcohol. Um, And in these patients, I regularly see the problem when they then uh, have their their cancer diagnosed, they have liver cirrhosis, so they are not eligible for most of the treatments. They might not be eligible for surgery when they have uh, signs of decompensation. They might not be fit enough to tolerate chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Um, So smoking not only uh, brought them uh, to the cancer or the combination of smoking and other risk factors, but also then uh, withholds optimal treatment from them. And I think this is also something we should consider in our discussions with the patients, that it's not... Sometimes patients tell me like, yeah, nowadays you can treat cancer, so it's not that bad uh, anymore, but that you have to tell them when you have liver cirrhosis and cancer, it might be very bad because you can't get any uh, proper treatment. Exactly. One of the issues that we were discussing yesterday when we were preparing this is that the fact that when you you stop drinking, you gain weight, and it's well known that when you stop smoking, you gain weight. And I remember that because sometimes some of the addiction centers for eat, for uh, binge drinking, binge eating, or uh, smoking are the same. And I have to say that there are some case reports and some small studies shown the baclofen, which is anti-craving medication for binge drinking, also for binge eating, also have been shown to be effective for smoking. So remember that, that some of my patients that have been drinking, plus they're trying to, to stop smoking, have kind of oral anxiety when they're anxious, baclofen could be go, good for all purposes. Well, I'm I'm glad you mentioned studies. So let can I can, can we kick the data on this a little bit? Let's take a slightly alternative view. All of us are all of us are sort of um, uh, physician scientists here. Let's really kick the data. So let's assume that the reason this hasn't percolated to the top is not because of a blind spot or a negligence on the part of the specialty. But how strong are the data out there, and what data do we need to drive that? Because You know, when you actually look, um, all of us did this, when you look to see the data that are out there, there are observational studies, there are associations, there are issues, rinse and repeat for every association study in liver disease, case definition, ascertainment of the risk factor, um, determination of the outcomes, it's the same issues. So what data are there? Where's the gap? Where should we be focusing um, academic efforts? I'm happy to say my, my, my we recently reviewed uh, this topic for general hepatology and this emerging, I think, accumulating data, number one. 
the data quality is suboptimal. I think, for example, we noticed the most clinical trials in NAFLD did account for alcohol drinking and smoking as a cofactors if you respond to a therapy or not. And we we saw that I think the percentage that we show in this review is 10, 15% of the studies as the patients about the smoking. I think one of the the first the main problems for epidemiological studies is that we don't collect the data properly. There is more experimental data. For example, we did a study long, many years ago showing that obese rats were more sensitive to the deleterious effects of smoking in the liver than lean rats, showing that the combination of obesity and smoking was worse for the liver. But as I say, epidemiological data is always complex to interpret. It's difficult to separate one risk factor to the other. But in general, I think the smoking data should be better collected prospectively in non-liver clinics. It's a very good point. It's a very good point. And also, if I sort of may raise, we've obviously talked a lot about associations, and I think a lot of the data is associations uh, with a lot of confounders, as, uh, as you pointed out, Remel. Um, but there have been, been some interesting uh, publications recently about the gut microbiome, Vanessa. Um, and I know there was a, a Dutch study published very recently, uh, rolling more than 8,000 patients across, uh, or, or individuals, I should say, really, across three generations, that looked at the effects of smoking um, and how that might evolve into the development of chronic liver disease. Did you want to sort of comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's indeed very interesting uh, because there was not a lot of literature out there on smoking and liver diseases. And actually, uh, I also tried once to establish uh, a connection between smoking and liver disease in one of my cohorts, which was much, much smaller, like about 100 patients, uh, and was not successful. The reason was uh, that we did not collect the data properly. And this is also what you now very nicely see in this large uh, Dutch Lifelines cohort. They already published on the on these topics on uh, on factors that influence uh, the composition of the microbiome. Some years ago, I think it was in 2016, Sasha Tsernakova from Groningen uh, published this, uh, where the effect of smoking was not so clear. But now they have this very large cohort of over 8,000 individuals, over several generations and they also improve the collection uh, of uh, how they assess uh, smoking so they uh, uh, discern between active smoking passive smoking past smoking and they could really very nicely uh, and yeah it's a bit frightening show uh, that um, smoking has an effect on the taxonomic composition of the gut microbiome with an increase in potential pathogenic species and also when you look at the figures carefully what I think is even uh, more frightening a strong decrease in uh, potentially uh, beneficial species like Fecalibacterium prosnitsi, Akamansina, Akamansia mucinophila, all those that we know very well that produce short chain fatty acids that are good uh, uh, for health promotion. And the, the really important thing is that passive smoking has uh, not the same, but very similar effects than active smoking. And that this also is brought forward. So when you were exposed to passive smoke in uh, smoking in the childhood, you uh, carry these uh, negative changes in the microbiome for forward into adult life. And I think this is something very, very important. I mentioned this before already, um, uh, that uh, smoking is something where you don't only harm yourself and your liver and your lung and your heart, but you also may harm other people. And that, you know, that could, that could well be the driver, couldn't it? That could be the, the little chip of motivation. But I think, you know, you're starting to talk about the sorts of numbers before you can get signals. And I think that's a really important message is that if we want to understand particularly something like smoking, we ought to mention that there's a huge amount of intersectionality here of smoking with other lifestyle factors, socioeconomic status, education uh, completion levels, um, uh, risk of working, uh, you know, shift work, dietary consumptions, alcohol consumption, they're certainly linked, aren't they? So there's a lot of intersectionality here, but you've, you, you've very elegantly demonstrated right there that if you don't have the numbers, that if you don't have the infrastructure and quite frankly, the investment to do the research properly, we will maintain this associative level of research. And, you know, I, 
of course, it goes beyond that, though, doesn't it? Of course, we've got mechanistic insights as well. You know, Ramon, you mentioned your review article in it. You've really nicely um, highlighted, and I would recommend uh, listeners pull that article from last year uh, and read it because it covers the, the existing data. But, you know, the impact on fibrosis development, the likely effect on tonal receptor signaling and inflammatory mediators, mm -hmm. direct effects on gut uh, permeability, so those... Um, gut microbiome changes you've just described, Vanessa, actually having a greater impact on host immune systems and inflammatory processes. So I think we have, although I'm, I started off by kicking the data, I think there's enough here to, to be confident that it is the right thing to be doing for the liver, notwithstanding the rest of the body, for the liver to advise our patients to stop smoking altogether. But so I think we need more research in this mm -hmm. space. Some of the mechanism, I always say smoking is a pro-aging mechanism. People have smoked or drank very heavily, often look older at your, when, at your visit that they, they are biologically. And there are studies, for example, showing that telomerase, that is a shortening of some of the genes that determine the aging of your liver, is increased by smoking. It's one of the pro-oncogenic or pro-liver cancer mechanisms. Also, it's a pro-oxidative oxidizes your body is pro oxidant it causes oxidative stress and when you have another cause for example as obesity or alcohol promoting or even an autoimmune disorder pvc or psc and you smoke you have more chances to progress to cirrhosis so by stopping and smoking you can regress the liver I always say is a good person is a good organ compared to others give you a second chance when you don't have a very advanced liver disease try Try to change your lifestyle because your liver will improve in some cases to a completely normal liver and will give you a second chance. That is a good thing to say to the patients. So can I maybe ask you now, so, you know, knowing that we've got lots of clinical practice guidelines on, on management of all sorts of aspects of hepatology, you don't really see stopping smoking appearing in any of the guidelines. Now, that could be because we don't have that kind of grade 1A evidence base because we have largely associations, but should we be putting this in our guidelines, do you think? What do you think? I would be very brief, 100% on board, yes, yes. Yeah, I also agree with this. Uh, should be in the guidelines, even when it's not uh, the top level evidence. I think there is generally enough evidence on the toxicity, direct and indirect, on the liver and the immunological uh, aspects and the pro oncogenic aspects that uh, uh, it, uh, yeah, uh, there is enough strength in there to say stop smoking. I would like, if I may, because we are at the end a little bit, is to talk about transplantation. That not only in many centers, for example, I have practice in America, in the USA, a Medicaid, for example, the public system doesn't allow any transplant in smokers, what's, no matter what is your organ. But also we have to remember that, for example, patients with alcohol-induced liver disease, the main cause of mortality after transplant is cancer due in many cases because of smoking. So it's very important not to smoke to get a transplant because smoking really, really impacts the outcomes and the survival after liver transplant. I don't know if, if in the UK and other countries in Europe, the more public system is a little more permissive than in the USA, but I think there is a trend to be a little tougher in the terms of, of smoking I don't know what, yeah. what what is in your centers. I don't know. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, in Austria, we are a country where smoking uh, is still not seen as such a big problem. We also have a president who smokes. Um, and unfortunately, I have to say, in Austria, there is no real demand that someone stops smoking before going on the waiting list. We aim for it with our psychiatry liver clinic, where we also see all the patients uh, uh, who go on the waiting list. We aim uh, for uh, uh, smoking cessation with, uh, uh, as it was already mentioned before, this is not something where you can just say, please stop smoking, uh, uh, you will manage this. You need a smoking cessation program. We have it in the hospital. We have it also via uh, the uh, the medical insurance, um, but 
I actually think when looking at the numbers at the risk, um, I think uh, we should be stricter and demand smoking cessation uh, before uh, someone can go on the list. I mean, I, I think the answer is definitely we should be looking at smoking as uh, part of our armamentarium for treating liver disease and its complications and the sequelae that our patients um, uh, suffer ahead. I think that what we really should be doing, though, you mentioned about putting it in the guidelines. I think, yes, by all means, we can put it in quality standards. We should absolutely be recommending this. But at the same time, we should be asking research funding organizations, we should be asking governments to put this at the top of the agenda, both in terms of policy and in terms of funding, so that that grade 1A data that you're talking about, Vanessa, can be attained. Because actually, uh, you know, we, we hold everything to high standards, to high standards before we put them into guidance. Well, let's generate those data to support that. In the meantime, there is enough reason for all clinicians to be speaking to their patients and asking them about smoking in any social history. It's what we expect of our third year medical students to be able to do. So we should be taking a, a smoking history. We've got to push that 55% up and we should be making sure that we've got access to smoking cessation services so that it isn't exactly as you say, Ramon, you know, stop smoking and come back in six months time and tell me all about it. Absolutely. I think that's a very, uh, very compelling uh, uh, statement there, Will. And I think we're just coming up really now to our 30 minutes. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to ha make any closing statements uh, into how they want to, to, to change things or how they want to see things changing. I think Will's just given his. <laughs> well, I would say just a phrase. Hepatologists cannot be longer ignoring the fact of smoking. And we have to be more proactive and not only recommend, but also assist our patients and convince them to put, stop smoking. Remember that the patients have to want to do it. We cannot force them, but we have to prepare them to make that decision and to take this very seriously. Yeah, I also, you, I, I also think that it is very important that uh, this uh, very important topic is seen on all levels. So on a societal level, uh, changing policies, politicians have to uh, agree with this, have to support this in all parts of our lives, uh, all the way down to the individual patient level whom we see in the liver clinic, where we have to address this, where we have to motivate them, have to give them access to smoking cessation programs um, and telling them what the risks are. Very good, very good. Good stuff. So look, I've, I've really enjoyed that discussion. Obviously, it's always a pleasure to chat with friends and colleagues about uh, a subject that's really close to uh, our hearts and matters to our patients. But um, at the end of this uh, particular uh, easel studio, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's my, my uh, pleasant task to remind you to tune in next week to find out about new and promising drugs in the pipeline for the treatment of uh, NASH, an area also very close to my heart. Um, so tune in for that and remember to become a member of easel and join the easel family. Thanks very much and good evening. Thank you. Everybody. Good evening, everyone.